Well, um, thank you very much um, and good morning, uh, Acting Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to speak here today. Uh, not my first visit to Queen's, but my first in, in this great hall, uh, and it really is uh, the perfect place uh, and a wonderful place uh, to make um, my first speech uh, in Northern Ireland as Taoiseach. And I particularly want to thank the College authorities for a really wonderful gift that they've given me, which is the Blackbird's Nest, an anthology of poetry from Queen's University Belfast, including a foreword from Shane Massini. And I see flicking through uh, some poems of the great John Hewitt. Um, and uh, I can't think of any gift more appropriate, given the fact that um, uh, I, I draw on both of those people uh, in the words that I'm going to uh, share with you uh, in the moments ahead. Uh, as you all know, since its foundation in the mid-19th century, Queen's has answered the question posed by your Latin motto. There has never been any doubt about what this university gives back through its teaching, through its scholarship, through its contribution to public life, it continues to give, educating and inspiring new generations every year. Of course, Queen's has a long and illustrious history and an association with my alma mater, Trinity College in Dublin, and indeed I'm the first graduate of Trinity to become Taoiseach. Mary McAleese, whose portrait is on the wall, received her undergraduate degree here and then went on to Trinity to become Reed Professor of Law. And your current Attorney General, John Larkin, followed on the exactly the same path. A Dubliner and a native of my city, Sir Edward Carson, was educated at Trinity College and represented the University in Parliament for 26 years and later became MP for Belfast and became forever associated with Ulster Unionism. Over one century apart, both he and I were members of the same debating society, uh, the College Historical Society, or the HIST, which had, gave me reason to come here uh, many times as a student. Uh, we both studied there uh, how to make speeches, how to develop arguments, and how to develop ideas. And in later years, Carson liked to joke that he'd taken a range of positions as a student that would surprise people, including speaking against Cromwell and against the Act of Union. I do fear someday that some historian will go back over the positions that I took as a student <laughs> and uh, make similar comment. Seamus Heaney also received his education here and is now honoured with a chair in Irish writing in Trinity. And there are, of course, lots of recent connections as well. The two series creators and executive producers of the Game of Thrones met while postgraduate students in Trinity and became best friends. And thanks to the success of that series, Belfast has received a massive tourism boost as people come here to see where so much of the series was filmed. Uh, two men from overseas who came to study in Ireland and their love of Ireland never left them. And I think if politics is the art of the possible, then art must be about imagining the impossible. And we need both in our lives and in our society in order to achieve real progress into the future. We need to be imaginative, and we need to be able to imagine the impossible, and then to try to make it a reality. And I don't think we should ever fear to hope for what may seem impossible today, because so often it can become reality in the future. Someone with very big ambitions for this university, and big ambitions for Northern Ireland, was your Vice Chancellor, Professor Patrick Johnston, who died so tragically in June. A dairy man, educated at UCD, he was one of the leading researchers in the fight against cancer and had embarked on a very ambitious program for this university. Stories of his eloquent speeches at graduation ceremonies and his good humour have travelled far. And on behalf of the Irish government, I offer my deepest sympathies to Isolt and their four sons and to all of those who knew him and worked with him. His sudden death reminds us of the uncertainty of life and our commemorations for the First World War do the same thing. 100 years ago this month, another phase of the Great War opened up with the Battle of Passchendaele. This time last year, I visited Belfast to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph and spoke of how it was necessary to remember war so we can pay homage to peace. And later I wrote in the Irish Independent 
that real unity comes from respecting different traditions and values, not by trying to obliterate or assimilate them. Our differences make us stronger, and diversity is an opportunity, and that very much remains my view as Taoiseach today. And in looking to the future, I believe we must look upon this island with fresh eyes and consider what it means to all of us. I was born in 1979, the same year that Lord Mountbatten was brutally murdered by the IRA, and a decade after the Troubles began. It was also the year in which a woman was appointed to the Cabinet in the Republic of Ireland for the first time since the foundation of the state, and was the year of the famous papal visit. But the Pope couldn't travel north. He had to make his plea for peace, or his plea for peace rather, from south of the border. Back then, south of the border, Ireland was a very different place, a very different country to the one it is today. Confessional, inward-looking, and underdeveloped economically by Western European standards. And the border itself was a very different place, a place of bloodshed, of violence, of checkpoints, a barrier to trade, prosperity, peace, and freedom, a brutal physical manifestation of the historic divisions on our island and our political failure. The first time I was eligible to vote was in the referendum to ratify the Good Friday Agreement. The vast majority of people on both sides of the island voted for a new future based on power sharing, equality, mutual respect and cooperation, north and south and east and west. History can often move slowly, but then things change all of a sudden. And I have only a limited recollection of the border and the troubles. But I know that like nearly everyone in this audience and on this island, we don't want to go back to that. So much in the past 20 years has changed for the better, and we need to hang on to that. The Republic of Ireland has changed to the point where it's now a country that is built on respect and equality before the law for all citizens, no matter what their beliefs or identity may be. It's a country that's now home to 800,000 people who weren't born in Ireland, making up 17% of our population. It's the first country in the world to vote by a national referendum to introduce marriage equality and enshrine that in our constitution. And we now have a new self-confidence as an island not on the edge of Europe, but at the center of the world and at the heart of a common European home that we helped to build. A founder member of the Euro and the single market, we have taken our place finally among the nations of the world. Your pro-chancellor, pro Professor English, has written that the concept of freedom has been a recurring melody in Nationalist Symphony. And I think we found south of the border over the past few decades that the kind of freedom that some people thought was impossible has been achieved through the international symphony of our membership of the European Union. So I passionately believe that being European is an essential part of modern Irish identity. It's an enhancement, not a dilution of who we are. And in my opinion, it's a tragedy of the Brexit debate that appears that this common European identity is not valued by everyone on these islands. The Ulster poet John Hewitt famously spoke of his multiple identities as an Ulster man of planter stock, as Irish, as British, and as European. And he believed we all had multiple identities, and that's what made us who we are that it's a strength, not a weakness, an opportunity, not a threat, and it's something we should embrace about ourselves and about others, rather than something that we should see as an impurity or a basis for exclusion. And I think that philosophy is at the very heart of the Good Friday Agreement, at the right of the people of Northern Ireland to be British or Irish or both, and with it, of course, the right to be European. And after Brexit, those rights remain making this part of Ireland and this part of the United Kingdom truly unique, and one that will need unique solutions if we are to preserve all that has been gained. For too long we've allowed competing identities and competing cultures and even competing histories to be used to define ourselves and define our neighbours. And to this very day, people continue to mark out the narrow ground, to cling to what Churchill memorably, memorably described a century ago, as the integrity of our quarrel. We should also remember that Churchill believed we needed to walk together 
in mutual comprehension. And in this spirit, only a few weeks ago, my forebears Taoiseach and Kenny stood side by side at the site of the Battle of Messine with the Duke of Cambridge, the leader of the DUP, and a former Sinn Féin mayor of this city, and the representatives of all strands of opinion on this island. And that moment of solemn contemplation and mutual respect proved how much things have changed for the better in the past 20 years. And if the challenge of the First World War was the challenge of that generation, I think perhaps the challenge for our generation is Brexit. The Brexit negotiations are now well underway in Brussels, and to quote Michel Barnier, the clock is now ticking. Every single aspect of life in Northern Ireland could be affected by the outcome. Your jobs and your economy, the border, the rights of EU citizens, the rights of cross-border workers, research funding, as was mentioned earlier, trade, agriculture, energy, our fisheries, aviation, EU funding, tourism, public services, the list goes on. And in October, and it's not that far away, I'll sit around the European Council table in Brussels with 26 other Prime Ministers and Presidents, and we will decide together whether sufficient progress has been made on the three key issues to allow the Brexit negotiations to proceed to the next phase. Those key issues, as you know, to the citizens' rights, the financial settlement between the UK and the European Union, and specific issues relating to Ireland. And it's going to be a historic meeting for this island. And it is my fervent hope that progress will have been made by then, but I do not underestimate for a second the enormity of the challenges that we face. For our part, the Irish Government will discharge our responsibilities as co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement. We will do all that we can in Brussels, in London and in Dublin to achieve the best outcome for everyone on this island, to protect our peace, our freedoms, our rights and our prosperity. And I will talk, as I have in recent weeks, to the First Ministers in Scotland and Wales, two people with whom I share a common view, a view which favours the United Kingdom remaining in the single market and the customs union. And today we need an answer to a very simple question. Who do I, who do we in Europe speak to when we want to speak to Belfast? Who will speak for Northern Ireland and her 1.8 million people? Time is running out, and I fear no extra time will be allowed. And it will come as no surprise to anyone here that I don't want there to be an economic border on the island, nor do I want one between Ireland and Britain. And by an economic border, I'm not talking about currency or variations in tax rates. I am talking about a barrier to free trade and commerce. And indeed, as recently as last November, the North South Ministerial Council which included the DUP and Sinn Féin at the time, and the government which I now lead, said exactly the same thing, agreeing four very simple principles as to how we should work together. First of all, recognising the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland, bearing in mind its unique history and geography. Second, ensuring that the treaties and agreements between Ireland and the UK are fully taken into account. Third, and perhaps most importantly, protecting the free movement of people, goods, capital and services and fourthly, maintaining the economic and social benefits of cooperation. So I think on this matter, we should have much common ground and should be working towards these common objectives we've already agreed, that is, the Irish government and the major parties here in Northern Ireland. However, there are people who do want a border, a trade border between the United Kingdom and the European Union, and therefore between Ireland and Britain, and therefore across Ireland. And these are, of course, the advocates of the so-called hard, hard Brexit. And I believe the onus is on them to come up with proposals for such a border and to convince us and convince you, citizens, students, academics, farmers, business people, civil society, that such a border would be in your interest and that these, these borders would not be barriers to trade and commerce. They have already had 14 months to do so, which should have been ample time to come up with detailed proposals. But if they cannot, and I believe they cannot, then we can start to talk meaningfully about solutions that might work for all of us. 
For example, if the United Kingdom doesn't want to stay in the customs union, perhaps there can be an EU-UK customs union instead. After all, the European Union has a customs union with Turkey. Surely, therefore, it's possible to have one with the United Kingdom. And if the United Kingdom does not want to stay in the single market, perhaps it could enter into a deep free trade agreement with the European Union and rejoin EFTA, of which it was a member prior to accession, or the European Economic Area. And if these things cannot be agreed now, then perhaps we can have a long transition period during which the United Kingdom stays in the single market and the customs union while we work all of these things out. And I think this is the space in which agreements can be made. And these are the practical solutions I am proposing. And I think it would be helpful if others did the same. These solutions, of course, will not be offered. They will have to be asked for. And this can only happen after sufficient progress is made on an agreement on the financial settlement, citizens' rights, and key issues relating to Ireland, including the common travel area. And it's one of the real positives that both the British government and the Irish government, Prime Minister May and I, are committed to maintaining that common travel area, which of course is so much more than a common travel area. It's almost like a common citizenship that allows British and Irish people to live, work, reside, study, and access healthcare and housing in each other's countries as though we were citizens of both. And we must ensure that we protect our critical relationships in the many changes that lie ahead. Cooperation between North and South has also been very important in normalizing relationships on this island and bringing real and practical benefits to all of our citizens. It's a key part of the Good Friday Agreement and is also embedded in the common framework of EU law and EU policies. In my former role as Minister for Health, I've seen the benefits that working together can bring. And often the greatest benefits are those that are low key and aren't advertised so much. Patients on both parts of the island now benefit from very significant developments in cross-border healthcare. Since May last year, a cross-border cardiology service gives patients in Donegal suffering from a STEMI heart attack direct access to services in Alton Galvin Hospital in Derry, where previously they had to be transported from Donegal to Galway. And those of you who know the geography of Ireland very well, getting from Donegal to Galway is quite a journey uh, than going from Donegal to Derry. And of course, Donegal on its own didn't have the critical mass to sustain such an emergency service, and nor did uh, Derry, Tyrone, and even Fermanagh together. But taking West Ulster together, there was a critical mass to provide high quality services to people that would not otherwise have been available to them near to their homes. And similarly, cancer patients in the Northwest can now attend the new radio radiotherapy unit in the same hospital, which I had the pleasure to visit and which the Irish government helped to fund. And it works both ways. Children in Northern Ireland with congenital heart disease now have their emergency surgery in Our Lady's Children's Hospital in Crumlin in Dublin, and will do so, I hope, in the new National Children's Hospital, which is currently under construction. And across this island, sport has also shown a great potential to bring us together. The joint work that we are currently engaged in, North and South, to bid for the Rugby World Cup in 2023 is hugely symbolic of the new relationship that exists on our island. And in September, I intend to travel to London for the next stage of Ireland's bid to host the Rugby World Cup in 2023. With the cooperation that I've seen to date between North and South, public and private, rugby and non-rugby sporting organisations, I'm very hopeful that we can land this prize. But I don't want to travel on my own. I'd like to travel with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister as well. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to wish the Ireland team very well in their upcoming games in the Women's Rugby World Cup, which as you know starts next week in UCD. And I'm really looking forward to being back in Belfast later this month for the final. While the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union, the government that I lead is committed to remaining at the heart of Europe, preserving the hard-won peace on our island and protecting and growing our economy in the face of Brexit. And as part of, as part of this, we're making preparations. We're currently developing an ambitious 10-year capital plan, a new national development plan, which will be finalised and published by the end of this year. It will outline significant investment in roads, public transport, energy, water, schools, higher education, hospitals and health facilities. And the capital plan will also include detailed funded plans to complete our national road network, 
including links between Dublin on the one hand and Derry, London Derry and Donegal on the other. We remain absolutely committed to contributing £75 million to the construction of the A5 and bringing that project to fruition. And in the same context, we'll also give consideration to other important infrastructural commitments, such as the Ulster Canal, the concept of the narrow water bridge, and improving line speeds on the Dublin Belfast rail line. The 10-year capital plan will also accelerate the delivery of Ireland's critical public transport infrastructure, including substantial investments in the ports and airports, which we will need as a successful global trading nation. And this infrastructure will be a benefit to the people and businesses on both parts of the island, assuming they can cross the border with ease. And it's important that the body politic across these islands should meet the challenges that we're now presented with and be clear about what we want to do and what we can realistically achieve. Above all, I think we must work together to ensure we protect the benefits of the peace process for all of the people on this island. The House of Commons, whose approval will be needed for any new deal, is due to rise for the party conference season in just six weeks' time. The crucial European Council meeting, which I spoke about, will take place in just 10 weeks' time. And we need to hear the voice of those elected representatives here in the North. We need an executive, an assembly, a North South Ministerial Council, and a British Irish Council up and running and acting in the interests of all of our people. And we need that more than ever and we need it now. To conclude, Senator George Mitchell, a friend of this place and a friend to many here, received over 50 honorary degrees during the course of his career. And he said none meant more to him than the one he received from Queen's in 1997. He went on to serve as Chancellor of the University for 10 years with honor and distinction. And Senator Mitchell suggested, not speaking about Northern Ireland, but speaking about another place, but I think it's still relevant, he suggested that compromise was not a weakness, but a virtue necessary to serve the well-being of future generations. And I think his words should be our guide in the difficult weeks and months ahead. Just last July, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson MP, who I'll have a chance to meet later on, joined us in the Irish Embassy in Britain to pay tribute to a great Irish parliamentarian, Willie Redmond MP. He, as you know, was killed in the fighting at Messine. And over the years, he's liked to quote a line from one of Willie's letters, and it's one that has really resonated with me. It was a letter to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. And Willie Redmond wrote this shortly before he died. And he wrote, and I quote, it would be a fine memorial to the men who've died if we could, over their graves, build up a bridge between North and South. And I believe we should all honor his words today at a time when Brexit threatens to drive a wedge between North and South, between Britain and Ireland, we need to build more bridges and fewer borders. And I promise I will play my part in helping to do exactly that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Taoiseach. The Taoiseach has kindly said that he's prepared to take some questions now from the audience. Um, there'll be a chance later in the day for the professional interrogators from the media to get a chance to meet with the Taoiseach. So this is uh, a pleasure for me now to open up the question session to the audience. There are microphones that will be able to come round to you. If you do want to introduce yourself before your question by saying who you are, then you're very welcome to do so. Uh, and it's a pleasure now to open up for the first question which is very close to you, Taoiseach, right behind you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor English. Taoiseach, on the topic of North-South relations, we know that students from the Republic of Ireland study here and vice versa. Students have a very proud history of advocating for social justice issues, as seen in the marriage equality referendum on May 22, 2015, something you are a strong advocate for North and South of the border. And we thank you for your solidarity at Belfast Pride tomorrow. Recently, you announced your intention to run various referenda over the next 18 months, beginning in June or July. The referendum on the Eighth Amendment is especially pertinent for students north and south of the border. As we all know, a high percentage of students travel or work abroad over the summer. 
Do you agree with us that in order to fully engage students, this referendum should be held outside of the summer months? Thanks, thanks very much. Um, it's a good, good question. I haven't been asked that one yet. Um, it, it is, we, we have a process um, that we've agreed involving a citizens assembly and involving a Rock to Soul party uh, parliamentary committee. Um, but what we're planning for is a, um, uh, is, is a referendum, um, probably May, May or June of, um, of next year. It's not as straightforward as just having a referendum. We have to have wording, legislation, a referendum commission and a campaign. Uh, so if we don't have it before the summer, then it'll probably not happen until the latter part of the year. So we haven't set a date yet. Um, we have had referendums in, in June before. I think the Good Friday Agreement was, was, was a June referendum, if I remember correctly, so was the fiscal treaty. And we've had elections in, in June as well. But um, I definitely take the point and get the message that, um, uh, that uh, younger people uh, would like to have the referendum happen at a time when they're in the country so that they can fully participate. Uh, so we will absolutely take that into account uh, in, uh, in, in setting a date. Um, I should say one important thing uh, that I think is really important for students uh, is the ability to continue uh, to be involved in student exchanges. Uh, and one of the best things that the European Union has ever done is, is Erasmus, allowing people to study in other universities around the world. I think there are 2.5 million Erasmus babies out there, uh, people who would not have been born <laughs> had it not been for, um, uh, for Erasmus. And I think, I think it would be an, be an enormous tragedy uh, if uh, the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland were cut off from the Erasmus program, taking away that opportunity uh, from young people, an opportunity that I had and future ge previous generations had, uh, but to take that away from young people now, uh, I think would be a terrible thing to do to them. Uh, and we do need to bear in mind that um, that that's one of the things that could be lost. Thank you very much. There's a question here. Um, Tisha, you're very welcome to Belfast. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming today and for speaking so eloquently. Um, the, the question I have really relates to the sufficient progress issue that you mentioned, uh, and in particular, um, whether you can understand the concern that any agreement that's likely to emerge either on the Irish issue or indeed more broadly with the British government will be effective. Um, there's been some recent controversy here over whether, for example, aspects of the Good Friday Agreement have been enforceable. The question then is really what, how best to make any agreements with the United Kingdom enforceable, not just uh, internationally, but effective domestically, north and south. Because I think the experience in the recent past has shown there may be a gap in that respect. I think the lapel mic should work. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, um, that, that's, a, that's a great question and not one I have a straight answer to give you at the moment. Um, what we'll do in, in October is the, the, head, the heads of government um, from the 28 member states will sit around the table. Uh, Prime Minister May will be asked to leave. Uh, and then the 27 of us then meet in what's called Article 50 format. Uh, and we will decide uh, whether or not sufficient progress uh, has been made. Um, and that will depend on what happens over the next few weeks on those three key issues. Uh, and one of the things that will have to be considered is, is how, how will any agreements um, be upheld and, and be, be enforceable at the moment, the mechanism by which most European agreements are upheld just through the European Court of Justice, um, which the United Kingdom has indicated uh, that it no longer wishes to um, be part of. So we would need to develop some other mechanism. Uh, and I don't know what that is, but that's one of the things I think will have to be will have to form part of the talks. Thank you. The next person to catch my eye was just in the fourth row there. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Gorham Elgott, thank you. Fault your road, Taoiseach. Um, I'm Barry McElduff, uh, Sinn Féin MP for West Tyrone. I was delighted that you mentioned the A5 in your uh, statement, in your lecture, and uh, just to seek you know, a recommitment uh, to the A5 as an essential project infrastructure-wise for the wider development of the North West. So just, uh, I wanted to keep the A5 on the agenda because rail infrastructure was removed from us in the 1960s, and it's our only chance 
road to opportunity in the northwest? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Um, I'm to totally with you on that issue. One of, one of the first meetings I went to as Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport back in 2011 or 2012 was at the time when we were slashing budgets because um, uh, the country was broke at the time and uh, it was a meeting with um, I attended with Brendan Howland and Sammy Wilson, who was then the finance minister, represented um, uh, the, the um, uh, Northern Ireland, and he managed to convince us, even at a time of budget cuts and austerity, to continue to set aside uh, funding for um, uh, the A5, which has since run into planning difficulties. Uh, but I'm absolutely determined that we get that road built. Um, it's not just important for uh, for Tyrone; it's, it's very important for Donegal uh, and for Letterkenny because um, Donegal, for all the reasons you know historically, has been cut off uh, and as, as a result of that not had the opportunity to share in, in the prosperity that has been experienced in, uh, in the eastern part of the country uh, and I'm determined that we should get that project um, up and running and done as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Next question. There's one at the back there, at the left, thank you. Thanks very much. Hello Taoiseach, uh, I'm Michelle Sherlow from Food and I and it was very encouraging to hear you speak this morning. Um, just wondered what you'd have to say to our agri-food industry who, as you probably know, uh, in processing food on this island, stuff at the minute goes across the border maybe four or five times. Um, we've just come out of our first ever year of food and drink and we're seeing a real growth in tourism here. Um, but at the minute the industry is just nervous about things like the uh, hard border and also the differences in uh, competition north and south in hospitality with BAT. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, as part of my engagements today, I'm uh, going to have lunch with business leaders, including business leaders and trade unions and other groups, uh, and that will include people from the, um, from the food industry. It, it's one of my biggest concerns if, if Brexit goes wrong, uh, that the food industry and agriculture north and south of the border uh, will be very um, badly hit. Um, you'll know, for example, when it comes to dairy, how much, how much with Lakelands and others just crosses the border back and forth. Um, uh, and if, if, we, if we have border checks and if we have different standards in particular, could be the biggest issue. Uh, if, for example, the United Kingdom were to have different standards that was to allow um, different types of beef, allow hormones and milk, things like that, uh, we're into a very difficult scenario. Uh, and uh, what I'd encourage the uh, industry to do, people who are in the food industry or in agriculture, is to get engaged in this issue, to fully appreciate uh, the extent to which um, Brexit going wrong could damage their jobs, their businesses and their livelihoods, uh, and to put pressure on their politicians um, to insist that the kind of Brexit that we have uh, doesn't impact negatively on jobs and industry in this part of the island. And that means um, remaining in a customs union and remain, remain, it means having some sort of free trade agreement. There's no technological solution, no tolling system uh, that's going to tell you what's in the milk or what standards the burgers are up to. Uh, that can only be achieved through common standards. Thank you. There was a question at the back on the right as well, please. Good morning, Taoiseach. Uh, Marie Coleman from the Department of History. You spoke a lot about cooperation on the islands over the centenary of the First World War. Michal Martin spoke last weekend about more contentious centenaries. How do you think the Irish government will approach the centenary of partition, which of course has renewed uh, resonance with Brexit and the communal violence on either side of the border that ensued in the early 1920s? Yeah, we, we haven't, haven't made a decision on that yet. We have a committee that's headed up by um, Senator Morris Man, our former Senator Morris Manning, who advises us on the commemorations. Um, we are now moving into uh, a very different phase of commemorations, um, ones that will be very difficult. Uh, for example, uh, the War of Independence, uh, and that will mean recalling uh, some atrocities that occurred, the, the, the terrible way Protestant people were treated in some parts of Cork, for example, uh, and in other places. It will evolve um, recalling the Civil War and some of the atrocities that were committed there as well, including um, my, my forebears, members of my party, deciding to execute people without trial. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of very difficult uh, commemorations that, that are coming up ahead. And that one will be one of the most difficult because, of course, um, for some people, remembering partition uh, is, is a catastrophe. Uh, it's, it's something that um, 
um, uh, people will very much commemorate and not celebrate. But for others, of course, it's going to be the foundation of the state in Northern Ireland and will be a, a, a cause for celebration for them uh, that uh, a state was founded in Northern Ireland and has lasted 100 years. Uh, so it's something we're going to have to deal with, I think, I think very sensitively. Um, and I'm confident we can do that. Uh, we've learned from 1916 and we've learned from uh, the First World War commemorations the way we can uh, commemorate, our, commemorate our history, respect each other, but not necessarily have to agree on everything. And I think perhaps that's the approach that we can adopt. Thank you very much. There's a question right at the front here. Just give me a microphone. Good, uh, good morning, Tisha. My name's Anne McGregor from Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Twice in your speech, you referenced the fact that um, we don't have an executive, once around the Rugby World Cup and the second around Brexit. How hopeful are you of an agreement by October, which is the latest deadline we've been told? Thanks very much. I'm, I, I'm, I'm always hopeful you couldn't possibly be in, be in this business if you were not. And, um, and uh, you know, one thing, one thing that occurred to me, I was just looking at the, the economic performance in, um, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, um, where we will balance the books next year. Our national debt is coming down. Unemployment is down by two thirds. Incomes are rising again. Uh, the country is becoming more equal. Uh, if anyone said, if anyone predicted that five years ago, you would have, you would, you would have been told to have your head examined. You would not have got on a single panel on RTE or TV3 or anything else because that was absolutely impossible and the country was finished forever. And uh, we didn't accept that. Um, we hoped for the future and we worked towards uh, the best outcome. And I am a hopeful person by nature. And I do hope that um, the executive can be put uh, back together, that the assembly uh, can meet. And I think it is really important because bear in mind when it comes to Brexit, uh, there won't be any Northern Ireland political parties involved in negotiations on Brexit. The negotiations happen between sovereign governments, uh, but the Northern Ireland executive can influence um, the outcome. They can influence the position that I take to the North-South Ministerial Council, and of course they've influenced in Westminster too. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have common ground already on, on, on where we'd like to go. We articulated that last November. It's in the joint letter um, signed by Martin McGuinness and, uh, and Arlene Foster. Uh, so I think we actually have a lot of common ground on this. Uh, and it's never been more important, I, I believe, uh, that we have an executive up and running so that we can get the best outcome for everyone. Thank you. The next question is here on the third row on the left, please. Tina McKenzie from Staffline Group. Thank you for an inspirational speech. It's great to hear some leadership around this time, especially in context to Northern Ireland. Um, I know you're hopeful about getting the executive up and running, I think, as we all are. But business people always make backup plans. So whilst our politicians are a small group of people in Northern Ireland, uh, there are many other groups that have vested interest. Uh, we have 4,000 people employed across this island, and we invested from the north to the south. It's very important for us that we can continue to grow our business for, for the benefit of, both, uh, of all of the island and all of the people. So surely there would be a benefit for you now to get some groups together, be it the business community, community groups, uh, other leadership within the civil service, to form a backup plan so when they say, who can we call in Belfast? Well, there are plenty of people here, Taoiseach, who want to make this work. I, 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 I certainly, certainly give this some thought and um, I, I very much identify with your sentiments that there are so many people in Northern Ireland um, who, who aren't involved in politics but care so much about uh, what happens here and what, want to be included and want to be involved. And it's one of the reasons why I'm having uh, the lunch that I'm having uh, today with, um, uh, with civil society and, and different groups. Um, but no, no civil society group, no business group, no trade union group is a substitute for an elected government. Uh, and that's the difference. Uh, the people voted, there have been any number of elections um, and referenda in Northern Ireland in recent times, and the people have voted for their representatives. Uh, and I would really encourage them to come together and allow the executive to be formed. I'll be meeting all the major parties later today. Uh, and it, it is a strand one issue. It's not for, for me or for the Prime Minister to impose solutions uh, on Northern Ireland, um, but it is for the parties to come together and form an executive. And we will do everything we can to support that. I know that we can keep the questions going for a very long time, but I'm also aware that the Taoiseach's schedule is a very tight one. Um, 
Leo, you can tell from the range and energy of questions how much people have really appreciated engaging with you this morning. It's a wonderful opportunity to hear you speak and to engage with you. Uh, we've had a wonderful session, eloquent, compelling, powerful talk, an excellent fielding of questions. We hope that we'll have you many times back to Queen's in the future, uh, but now I know that everyone will want to join me in warmly appreciating Leo Bradcombe.